Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. David Gall is professor at the University of Illinois Chicago, and he's made his reputation challenging accepted ideas in psychology, economics, and business, whether in science, warfare, or business. His forthcoming book on the topic is The Power of the Status Quo. David's work has been published in top tier journals in management, marketing, statistics, and psychology, as well as being featured in the New York Times, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and other major publications. <clears throat> he previously served on the faculty of Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, and he holds a PhD from Stanford University. We're very pleased to have David with us today to share his thoughts about challenging the marketing status quo. David? Thank you very much, Earl. Hello, everyone. My talk is gonna be about the difficulty of challenging the status quo in general and in marketing in particular. And the base of my talk is that the status quo is hard to change. That's not always the case, but it seems to be a general tendency. When you examine the history, as Earl mentioned, I look at the history of of business. I look at the history of warfare, of science, even medicine and sports, and a recurrent theme is that it's generally much harder to change the status quo than to stick with the status quo, and especially when changes are of the most fundamental sort. Why is change so hard? If we, if we try to look at the literature, and this is something that was intriguing to me in my own research, I've tried to challenge the status quo in terms of accepted beliefs in my field. And I always found it you know, very challenging and frustrating. And sometimes like I was banging my head against the wall. Other people I know had similar experiences and I tried to understand what are the factors that make the status quo so hard to change? And is there literature on this? What can we learn from existing literature? And often what you see is there's a lot of talk about the existence of a status quo bias. I say, oh, well, change is hard because of a status quo bias. But this really just restates the problem. It doesn't necessarily provide us with a lot of insight and then there's some explanations of the status quo bias, but these two aren't very satisfactory. Um, oftentimes they're based on relatively short experiments conducted in a lab and they're based on very circumscribed contexts. And so you don't really gain necessarily a lot of insight into why change is hard in a real world complex social marketplace. Um, and also then there's a lot of work that looks at individual cases, individual histories, and these are actually very instructive and interesting, but they tend to be relatively narrow. And so they're relatively idiosyncratic to particular context. So what I've tried to do is to look at a broad range of contexts and find cases where the status quo is very hard to change, in particular when change was necessary. Right? The we don't always want to change. Sometimes change isn't so good. But I've tried to look at cases where change was actually very necessary and was clearly needed, but yet the status quo strongly persisted in these cases, at least until a certain breaking point occurred. And so I tried to look at these cases that, as I mentioned, were in the military domain. And I find the military domain, by the way, very interesting because we tend to think that military uh, context or military decisions, people should be very much focused on doing what's best for the organization because the stakes are so high. The lives of soldiers are at stake, the fates of countries are at stake, and yet still we see oftentimes a very strong persistence of the status quo. But then I also look at a lot of business cases. I look at cases in science and sports and elsewhere and try to gain general insights. And so I wanna start by introducing one particular case and trying to abstract some insight from there and then talk more generally about what are the forces that help maintain or lead the status quo to persist even in spite of sometimes overwhelming evidence that change is necessary. So this particular case that I want to start with is the case of Percy Scott, who is this gentleman who you see his picture here. He is depicted in Spy Magazine. And he was a very influential officer in the history of the British Navy. He was active during the late part of the 1800s, early part of the 1900s. And he is credited with a lot of innovations that changed the face of naval warfare. Many, many very, very revolutionary Change is incredible, actually, how many revolutionary changes this one person was responsible in the history of naval warfare. And so he was a very influential officer. He also was known for having very little respect for formal authority and processes. Um, he referred to the Board of Admiralty that governed the British Navy, the Royal Navy, as the brainless admiralty. 
and he was described in the Times of London as a rather peculiar wild animal to set loose on a tame board of admiralty. In any case, this particular case uh, I want to start with is his attempt to convince the board of admiralty that they needed to prepare for submarine warfare, both offensive and defensive. And he was aware of the growing threat posed by the submarine from Germany. Again, this is right ahead of the years preceding World War I. And he had been familiar with developments in submarine warfare. And he had seen, as had many people that were close to the development process, had seen the advances that were being made in submarine warfare. And so it was very clear to him, as he states here in this quote, in all recent naval maneuvers, the submarine had over and over again demonstrated its deadliness of attack. And it should have been apparent to everyone that the introduction of these vessels had revolutionized naval warfare and put into the hands of the Germans a weapon of far more use to them than their fleet of battleships. So he tried to convince the Board of Admiralty through um, personal contacts, through writing letters to the board and to various admirals and officers. And he was dismissed and ignored. And so he took a rather unusual step. He wrote an open letter to the Times of London where he made his case and talked about the threat, the looming threat of submarine warfare. And this was published in June of 1914, just before, a month before the outbreak of World War I, two months before Britain was to join the war. And he received in response almost immediately dozens of editorials in the leading British newspapers, uh, poo-pooing his ideas and belittling them and saying that he was out of his mind. And I just selected a few choice quotes, but there are literally dozens of these. Uh, so here's one, Sir Percy Scott's ideas approach the boundaries of Midsummer Madness. As a romance or even a prophecy, Sir Percy Scott's forecast is fantastic, but as a practical tactics, it is so premature as to be almost certainly fatal it may safely be related, rele relegated, I believe I should say, to the novel shelf. And by the way, these, these editorials were either quoting directly or inspired by the comments of leading British admirals of the day. There's five admirals that went into press that talked about how his warning was unheeded, uh, leading naval strategists of the times. Admiral Sir E. Fremantle described Sir Percy Scott's eulogy of the submarine as a mischievous scare. Written by a literary man doing a scientific novel or scare tale, it would pass well enough. The imaginative, fancy picture-making spirit of the thing is out of place over Sir Percy Scott's name. And Mr. David Hannay throws doubt upon the value of the submarine. Indeed, he seems to regard it as little better than a clever scientific toy. So a month later, war broke out with Germany, and almost immediately, five British warships on patrol were sunk by German submarines, 4,000 men went to the bottom of the ocean. And subsequently, the German submarine campaign devastated. Uh, shipping to Britain were on the verge of starving Britain and forcing them to surrender. The prime minister said in 1917, if nothing could be done about the submarine campaign, Britain would soon lose the war. So um, why were they so slow to respond? I'll get to that in a moment. I just want to briefly mention um, how did the submarine campaign, how was the German submarine campaign defeated? It was ultimately defeated when the US uh, Admiral or Vice Admiral William Sims arrived in Britain as commander of US forces in Britain. He was actually a good friend of Percy Scott's. They had met when both of them were assigned to the China station of their respective navies and they had similar personalities. Sims was also did not care much for authority. He talked about uh, the naval establishment being unscientific and unmilitary, and a U.S. newspaper would ca called him a thorn in the side of the fat flesh of the naval hierarchy his entire career. So these guys were very similar in many ways, and they were close, and they both developed several innovations in parallel, or promoted several innovations in parallel in their respective navies. So when he came to Britain, uh, Sims was able to defeat the German submarine campaign by reintroducing the convoy system, which involved having destroyers surrounding commercial ships and sailing, end up sailing together. And this was also resisted very strongly by the naval establishment in Washington. He had to push uh, very strongly against it because they had already believed that the convoy system was outdated. It was a relic of the age of sail, and now we were in an age of steam-powered ships and 
uh, convoy was perceived to be obsolete. And even though there were a lot of arguments in his favor and tests have been conducted that showed it worked very well to stop the submarines from being effective because instead of hunting for submarines like a needle in a haystack, you only had to look for them right around the convoy area. Um, it was very strongly resistant, but Sims was able to overcome this through his advocacy and ended up defeating the submarine campaign. Okay, so why, why was the Board of Admiralty so reluctant to, um, so reluctant to do something about the submarines? They're so, una so unaware or blind, really, to the threat uh, posed by German submarines. And part of it, and again, I think these are three forces or three reasons that come up recurrently across time and different domains that lead to the persistence of the status quo. And part of it was the beliefs that they had. And beliefs tend not to adapt or evolve as quickly as circumstances and evidence. And the admirals of the British Navy, they were familiar with submarines of the past, which indeed were basically clever scientific toys. But as improvements in submarines occurred, as technology evolved, they became better and better uh, weapons of war, but yet the beliefs were not updated to reflect that of the Admiralty. And there's many reasons why beliefs are sticky. We'll talk about some of them. I think some are kind of obvious, but some are, are a bit more counterintuitive. And I'll try to talk a little bit about some of them. Uh, given the time we have, I can't go over everything, but I'll try to allude to some of them. Interests. Um, individuals have a stake in a particular, or income, interests refer to people's stake in a particular outcome or state of affairs. And these stakes, they can be material or financial, but they don't have to be. And then in fact, in many cases, some of the mo most powerful interests are about individuals protecting their reputation or protecting even their way of life. A job for most people is not just uh, an occupation, but it's also a way of life. And they have a certain attachment to that way of life that they try to maintain. And so in particular, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but this, this identity element is very strong as a type of interest that people have. And that tends to lead to resistance to the status quo. Um, but in the case of the submarine, for instance, so Percy Scott was coming from outside the Board of Admiralty. It was their job to prepare for future threats. And so it could be seen as threatening to their job, as threatening to their reputation for him to get credit for perceiving the submarine threat. In fact, in other cases, later during the war, Percy Scott developed a particular design for a depth charge, which is a bomb that's intended to sink and blow up submarines. And he developed this particular design but when the Board of Admiralty received the design, they had to improve upon it. And why did they have to improve upon it? Because they wanted to receive credit for its development. So this happened repeatedly. They would always try to improve things and their improvements would lead to very long delays. Oftentimes the result would be no better, in some cases worse than the original design. And in that time, a lot of time and money was wasted. Uh, complacency. Complacency refers to a lack of awareness or concern regarding potential dangers. And there's several different factors that lead to complacency, but certainly one of them is a history of success. And if you look at the British Royal Navy ahead of World War I, they were unchallenged on the high seas for you know, 100 years since the Napoleonic Wars. It was the Pax Britannica, Britannia ruled the waves, and they had a sense of invulnerability and confidence in their Navy that nothing could really threaten a British naval supremacy. They controlled all the major sea lanes and had a history of basically using the Navy to control piracy and slave trade and uh, stop the slave trade and so on. And so there was a very strong sense of complacency in the Royal Navy. So I want to look at a few different, uh, more individual cases and some that are more specific to what I would consider to be a marketing context because they un involve understanding the shifting preferences or the needs of the customer and talk about maybe a few uh, of these forces and how they play out in ways that might be um, not obvious at first glance. So I interviewed uh, Luis Mejia. He's a senior licensing, or was a senior licensing associate at Stanford. And he was in the office when Larry Page, who was then a 23 year old PhD student, came in and wanted to disclose his invention of the technology behind the Google search engine. And Mejia heard him come in and normally they would have scheduled an appointment, but he saw him come in. So they ended up speaking right then and there. He invited him to his office and he asked Larry what he wanted to do with the technology. And Larry said, um, 
you know, I don't want to build a business on my own. I want to finish my dissertation. I really just want to license it and want you to make me a lot of money. Because the way it works is Stanford owns the, the technology, but they pay some of the royalties were paid, would be paid to the inventor if they licensed it. Okay, so Larry and the other Google co-founders, Sergey Brin and Luis, when, and Luis was the one who had response. He was the one who had the authority to license it or not because it belonged formally to Stanford, the invention. And so the three of them went and met over a period of about two years with all the leading search engines of the day. And they were not, they didn't get much attention or much interest in acquiring the Google technology. And they were generally, uh, even for very low prices, they were offering to sell Google for under a million dollars, the technology, and it was not uh, acquired. And um, after a while, you know, they were, they were also telling Larry that, you know, they didn't understand business. They were engineers or technical people, but they didn't understand how business works. And then the founders of Google got frustrated and said, hey, we're going to actually show them that we do understand business and decide to form their own company, even though initially they just wanted to get back to doing their dissertations and didn't really want to start a business around it initially. And if you recall back at the time, internet search was actually very awful. It had started out okay, but then all the search engines were easily gamed. And for instance, if you pulled up, um, and they did this test actually at one of the offices of one of the search engines, where if you did a search for the word internet in one of the other search engines, you would get a sea of Chinese character, a bunch of results of a sea of Chinese character and the word internet sticking out. And if you did a search in Google for the word internet, you would get the first link would be, you know, pointing you to how to use web browsers. So much more relevant results, whereas the other search engines were, were garbage in a sense. So why weren't they more motivated to acquire Google? And one of the reasons is the belief that all the players had at the time. And it was the received wisdom in the entire industry. It was the received wisdom of the tech press, of Wall Street analysts, they were being praised for this, is that they were no longer, search was no longer relevant. They believed search was no longer relevant. Now the reason it was no longer relevant in some ways was because it, the results were so bad. But putting that aside, they believed that they were evolving to become portals. What people wanted was portals, basically a central point where a central access point that I could have links to all sorts of different types of content, whether it was stock quotes or message boards or weather and so on. So they were all evolving, all these leading search engines were evolving to become portals and that was where they were going. And so getting great search results wasn't really that important. And even though they saw a vastly superior technology to their own with the potential to completely upend their industry, and even after they didn't acquire Google, they didn't change their search technology to more closely than the Google because they still for a long time persisted in becoming portals. They saw themselves as, as portals. So this is this idea of social proof. Everyone kind of believes the same thing and they're spurred on by this virtual echo chamber of the technology press, the Wall Street analysts, the competitors. Everyone believes that um, one particular idea is the right one. And so even when you have the situation changes, circumstances have evolved, new evidence has emerged of something that could change the game, they still stuck with their existing beliefs that they should be focused on portals. And if you look at the Google search engine even today, uh, but certainly back then, they made it clear, we are not a portal. We are about search, right? They had a very blank page without content links. It was all about, about search. Um, so we talked about interests and thinking about interests, not just, we typically think of interest in terms of material terms or financial terms, but identity is a very important part of interest and in in a way that they hold back the status quo. Um, an interesting case is Intel and they're trying to shift, their attempts to shift to more uh, mobile design chips or chips designed for mobile platforms. And one example early on is in the late 90s when they tried to, um, they were so focused on, had, and historically they were focused on the whole industry. Again, this is a bit of a groupthink echo chamber thing where the whole industry, both the competitors, so AMD, the customers in terms of the big PC manufacturers like Hewlett Packard and Dell, the end users, everyone was focused on these more and more powerful chips, right? higher megahertz, gigahertz, whatever, processors. And the mobile market was a bit of an afterthought, even though it was growing relatively rapidly, for example, laptops, they typically would design a chip for a desktop PC, and then a scaled down version would be used for a laptop. So it was a bit of an afterthought, and their whole thing was about power, 
and their advertising promoted that. The customers were educated to really focus on power and buying the chip that had the most megahertz or gigahertz and so on. But a lot of it was also tied to identity. So there was a strong uh, sense in Intel that we build the most powerful chips and among the engineers that they build the most powerful chips. And so when a new technology was developed, for example, the Centrino, what became the base of the Centrino technology was developed in the late 90s at Intel's Israel R&D Center. They mostly dismissed it. And in fact, they initially, uh, Paul Odellini wanted to kill the, that development project because he thought that we need to go for faster and bigger and so on. And that towards a more power efficient chip, that's not what Intel did. And so this issue of identity, how Intel and how its employees perceive themselves as building the fastest, most powerful chips and suddenly needing to change that identity to focus on building things that were more efficient and sleeker, that was a very profound shift in how the engineers and how the people in the company in general thought about themselves as Intel. And this played out also with the development of Wi-Fi chips and so on. If you look at some other cases also, an interesting example from the history of warfare is steam warships. So steam, it was pretty obvious by the middle 1800s that steam warships were becoming superior to sail ships. Um, they had, you know, they were easier to navigate close to shore, into port. They weren't reliant on wind. They were much safer in a storm and so on. But there was a lot of conservatism to retain sailing ships. And that's because the, the identity of sailors, I and mean, we call them sailors even to this day, was tied very closely to sail. The great naval strategist, Alfred Thayer Mahan, reflect on this history, talked about the parting with sails as the mode of reliance of a ship of war was characterized by an extreme conservatism. And he talked about, so, and several other naval historians point out that this was because in many cases, there was a romantic attachment to sail. Sail was seen as a way of life and one that was of great value and of great importance to the identity of naval officers. So here's a quote from Sidney Early Wilmot. He says, there was a strong prejudice to overcome in the minds of those who retained a vivid recollection of the glories accomplished in the past under sail and who had a natural love for the art in which we excelled. And I'll show you just two more quick quotes on this. Uh, the old pride in the sailing ship with her taut and graceful spars could not be made to yield at once to innovation. And lastly, uh, Elting Morrison, uh, historian of innovation at MIT, wrote this in the 1960s, but it was based on uh, an 1869 report to Congress by a Navy board that was arguing against adopting uh, steamships after, despite their strong performance in the Civil War. And Elting Morrison comments on that report. He says they had the innocence to say they were moved by a feeling they had against her. They just didn't like her. They had a concept of what a seaman was, his obligations, his spirit, his sense of purpose. And this concept was not sustained by men lounging through the watches of a steamer. It's funny, I had uh, in one of my MBA classes, Rick Lenny, who was the CEO of Hershey, but previously had headed the Oscar Mayer brand. And he talked about when they switched to, when they tried to develop Lunchables, which became a huge uh, profit, very profitable product for Oscar Mayer, there was a lot of resistance for these identity reasons that the employees of Oscar Mayer perceived themselves as making no frills meats. And this idea of making these prepackaged, ready to eat meals just ran against the identity of what they believed the company was. So I think this is sometimes an overlooked uh, type of interest that tends to maintain the status quo. Uh, finally, thinking about complacency. Um, again, as I mentioned, there's many reasons for complacency, but I think one of these reasons is that um, firms oftentimes mistake success for strength and even invulnerability. Uh, but just because you're successful, that doesn't mean you're not vulnerable. In fact, in many cases, you can be very vulnerable, but just no one has come along with the killer instinct to really change the status quo. And so an example I can use here is Capital One, when the founders of Capital One, uh, Nigel Morris and Richard Fairbank, were banking industry consultants, and they observed that basically every major bank had the exact same credit card product. All of them had the same, I think it was like 19%, 19.9% APR, uh, same annual fee, and they all appealed only or only marketed to prime customers, customers with very good credit. And so they went around to 
because of emerging advances in uh, digital marketing technologies, databases, and so on, and ability to digital printing to send out customized offers and computing power and so on, they perceived the ability to engage in what they termed information-based marketing, which is to customize cards much more closely to individual customers. And so they went around to uh, 20 leading banks and pitched their idea and they didn't find a lot of interest and until they ultimately found one relatively small bank in Richmond, Virginia, Signet Bank, which let them uh, run Signet's credit card operation. But why weren't these other 19 or so banks interested? And what it seems like was the case is that the credit card was actually a huge profit center for banks. They were very successful and they were essentially a cash cow. They required very little attention. There was very little customization there and they were providing a lot of profits to the banks without a lot of attention. But again, they were actually very vulnerable. Once Capital One came in and a few other players also um, had more aggressive strategies, these profit centers collapsed for many of these banks. And so they were very vulnerable even though they were successful. But oftentimes we tend to mistake uh, success for invulnerability. All right, so why am I, so this is, this is a general, but I'm presenting this in terms of, in the context of marketing. And I think it, these are, of course, they're general, the difficulty of changing the status quo, but it's especially relevant to us who are engaged in marketing because the marketing environment is always changing and our job is to respond to changes in this environment. There, is, there are competitive entrants, new customer preferences or evolving preferences, change in distribution channels and technological change all of which influence the market and it's our responsibility as marketers to be able to adapt to those changes. And oftentimes those changes within a particular business organization are very strongly resisted. I gave the example of Google and Capital One, but also we see many other examples like why have let's say rental car companies been slow to adapt to Uber or hotels to Airbnb and so on. And why didn't they originate actually these types of services within as these technologies occurred, right, this uh, smartphone technology, why weren't rental car companies more attuned to that and let someone like Uber uh, innovate or initiate this particular technology? And then we also in marketing have the emergence of all sorts of new tools and platforms. And these require us to, to interpret how this affects the preferences of the customers and how it also changes the rest of the marketing environment, the channels, that we have to reach customers and so on. For example, with online reviews, how does that affect the nature of customer preferences? And customers are very reliant now on these online reviews. And I think one of the ideas that has been put forth that I think has a lot of credence is this actually increased importance of product quality in many cases because online reviews have become so important. But yeah, so we have to constantly adapt as marketers to the change and thinking through how this, these changes might be resisted is important and also, of course, how they can be overcome. All right, I want to put a few caveats before I talk a little bit about how, at least historically, we've seen the status quo be broken or changed. I don't want, to, I mean, this seems obvious, but I don't want to be construed as suggesting that all change is good. Of course, not all change is good, but sometimes change is essential and it still seems to be resisted, again, particularly when it is a more fundamental sort of change. Also, sometimes organizations pursue change thoughtlessly for the sake of change. And of course, that's not something that I uh, am recommending or advise. And of course, I'm not suggesting that an organization never pursue change. Sometimes organizations do adopt necessary changes, um, but oftentimes they do so after significant resistance. And it's very rare to see a, a fundamental change without significant resistance within an organization. And finally, a last caveat, um, Changing the status quo is very tough and many people I've talked to have tried to do it uh, in different types of contexts. Uh, talk about it, it takes a mental health toll. Here's an open letter from Nasir Gaimi. He's a psychiatrist at Tufts University and he recently wrote an open letter of advice to medical students considering entering his specialty of psychiatry. He said, are you willing to spend your entire career fighting the powers that be? You may become a hero for future generations if you succeed in the process of change in the long run but that posthumous adulation will do nothing for your personal happiness in this life. The awards go to those who maintain the status quo, not to those who change it. 
Uh, if you are successful in changing it, you might get the awards. But the reality is um, most of the times the change the status quo are very difficult and oftentimes unsuccessful and can certainly take a toll. And in fact, when I tried to uh, challenge the idea of loss aversion when I was a graduate student, my advisor warned me not to attempt to do so until after I got tenure because it could be threatening to my career. So very similar advice to what Nasir Gaimi gave to these medical students. And he was right. I mean, he was, it was wise and well-intentioned advice. All right, so how is the status quo broken? Well, looking at, at history, I see kind of three main ways that the status quo tends to be broken. Oftentimes these operate in concert together, just like the forces of the status quo also operate that together and interact with each other. And one is that there's an external force. What do I mean by external force? It doesn't necessarily mean somebody from outside the organization or company, but it should be someone above the level where ch necessary change needs to happen. In many cases, needs to step in and make change happen. To give one example, um, William Sims, who I mentioned earlier, who uh, reintroduced the convoy system to break the German submarine campaign in World War I. Earlier in his career, when he was a lieutenant in the US Navy and was stationed at the China Station, he saw a new development that Percy Scott introduced for naval artillery that turned naval artillery from an art into a science. It was called continuous aim firing. Firing from ships historically has been extremely inaccurate because the ocean rolls up and down. And so you can't get a precise uh, aim at your target throughout the roll of the ship. And so he developed, Percy developed this technique, Sims observed it, implemented it on his ship, and it created a revolution. It started what was called the gunnery revolution in naval artillery. And he then documented this, these improvements, wrote maybe 17 reports that he sent to the Navy leadership and sent them to officers throughout the fleet. And these were generally ignored. Only when he finally wrote a letter that Theodore Roosevelt, who was the president at the time and had been former secretary of the Navy, uh, Roosevelt and Sims called this the rankest kind of insubordination because he was leapfrogging the chain of command. Um, and he thought he would be court martial and some people threatened to court martial him. But to his benefit, Teddy Roosevelt read the letter, took interest in it and forced a test between um, the continuous aim firing and the more traditional firing, firing on the roll that had been the traditional practice and saw the huge advantage that occurred. And so this external, Teddy Roosevelt essentially acted as an external force to impose this change. So the person has to be, change oftentimes has to come from outside the, the level of the organization where change is needed, or it can come in many cases from outside the organization or outside the industry when there is an echo chamber. Like we see um, Airbnb changing the lodging industry by coming from outside or we see Apple coming from outside the phone industry or outside the music industry to change those industries. Um, competing ideas is very critical. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, it's not enough just to have an idea and to put your idea out into the world. We tend to think, and I thought initially when I had my loss aversion paper published that it was gonna change, people are gonna notice it and it was gonna change the world. And the reality is that ideas don't sell themselves. That science is kind of obvious, but I think for many of us, we think, well, the evidence should speak for itself. And once we put the evidence out there, that's enough. But the reality is that we have to pay a lot of attention to, for want of a better term, marketing, right? Persuasion, persuasion and rhetoric and how to organize ideas logically and also do it in a very sustained fashion. So an example I give here is Billy Mitchell, who's known as the founder of the US Air Force. And he, came back from World War I a hero because he led the Allied air campaign in that war, but there, then planes were still very much embryonic and they were not decisive to the war. But he pushed very strongly for having an independent air force, not having it subservient to the Navy and Army. And there was a lot of interests in the Navy and Army and having the Air Force be subservient to them, to being under their command. And so there was very much resistance to the idea of having an independent air force. And so he took the tack of both approaching members of Congress's idea uh, repeatedly, advocating for his idea in the press, writing letters to the New York Times and op-eds in the New York Times um, and other newspapers, also staging various types of new innovations in, in, in uh, air power. So for example, having like these long range bombers that could fly long distances, 
staging bombings, creating a competition of staging bombings of aging battleships and showing how air, aerial bombing could destroy them, even though they were thought to be unsinkable and so on. And these got captured the popular imagination and got a lot of attention. And he, was, he went over the top and he actually ended up being court-martialed, but he is still recognized today as the father of the US Air Force for his pushing of these uh, ideas and going around, in many cases, the traditional hierarchy. And the last uh, type of mechanism that we see repeatedly for breaking the status quo is a sense of urgency. The Nobel Prize winning economist Milton Friedman said, uh, only a crisis, real or perceived, can inspire real change. And that seems to be the case in many, in many cases, at least as a general way. We see, for example, Intel switched from making memory chips to making microprocessors because the Japanese were eating their lunch. And they set, saw this urgency and they felt the heat from the Japanese and felt that they needed to change. And there's many other cases where we see this. Um, and it doesn't have to be that you're necessarily with your back to the wall, but you're creating this perception of crisis. First, having the vigilance to recognize, constant vigilance to recognize and prioritize threats and opportunities. Oftentimes, you know, threats and opportunities aren't prioritized, even though we recognize them, we, don't, we keep doing the things that we had initially scheduled on our agenda. I talked to one friend of mine who works at a big a beverage company, and he had an idea that was seemingly urgent, and he talked to the head of marketing research, who also agreed that it was a very important idea, but she told him, you know, this is uh, something I have on the schedule for 2022. And so there was no sense of urgency around it because there were other things already on the schedule. So it has to be a reprioritization. And we can see this, for example, in, uh, let's say, Microsoft's response to the emergence of Netscape and the internet, where they were very slow initially to respond to the rise of the internet. But then Bill Gates wrote a memo that basically changed the direction of the company. And still the sense of urgency talked about how central the internet was to the future of software and computing and that everything had to be designed around the internet. And so he really instilled a sense of urgency in the company. So these are three recurring means that we see to break the status quo. All right, so I, I kind of give a, a broad overview here, but I try to, what I try to do is think about these things as a sort of framework of having, here are the forces that um, lead to persistence of the status quo, and here are the means that have historically been shown to break the status quo. And of course, there's a lot of nuance and details and ways to structural structurally adapt an organization to these. But I try here in this talk to give a broad overview of these different forces and the means to break them. So I now would love to answer any of your questions. Great, thanks a lot, David. That was very interesting. Uh, it does give us a lot to think about. Um, I'm glad you brought up the example of Billy Mitchell. I was gonna mention there's really a great movie with Gary Cooper starring in that many years ago. I'm not sure how accurate it is to the actual events, but in that, rendition of the story, he demonstrated the value of the, the bomber attack on battleships by breaking the rules of the engagement and having them drop down to a low altitude and actually hit and sink the battleship against all expectations. So I wonder if that is itself an example of one of the things that you need to do is kind of break the rules. Uh, a lot of times, whether it's in innovation or marketing campaigns or whatever, there's sort of guardrails, boundaries, expected practices that constrain what you can do. And I wonder if some of your examples aren't of people that basically said, I'm gonna break the rules. I'm gonna try something very different and see what happens. I'm just curious to get your thoughts about that. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. I think there's a lot of uh, oftentimes implicit rules or norms that govern um, people's beliefs and behaviors about what's possible. And you'll see actually in these people like Billy Mitchell and William Sims and Percy Scott, and then many similar types of people in business like Steve Jobs or uh, Craig Venter from Solera Geno Genomics. Genomics. Um, a type of personality that likes to challenge convention. In fact, I've done some research also looking at um, what personality correlates in a CEO predict um, whether the organization is innovative or not. We find actually that people who have this tendency to like breaking rules is uh, correlate with it. Now, I, I will put a caution on that and a caveat on that as well, which is that sometimes they take that too far. So Billy Mitchell, he was very into breaking rules, but he also, you know, you can't just break rules all the time. You have to also work within the constraints of the organization. He was too um, 
pushing of the boundaries in some cases and ended up being court-martialed. Um, and similarly, Percy Scott, I mean, you don't, you need to make allies, right? And so he oftentimes alienated a lot of people that could have helped him by constantly pushing rules and being very, um, in some cases, even obnoxious to, 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 a, to, a, to a point. Uh, by the way, I wanted to mention to the audience, again, you can send your questions directly to us. We'll screen those and pass them on to uh, David, but use the uh, chat function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Jackie had a question about to what extent uh, your examples and advice are different than some of the, uh, dare I say, conventional wisdom about uh, the dangers or pitfalls, the risk involved in, in really radically new technologies. There, there's going to be naturally, a, not just within the company, but among potential consumers, let's say, a resistance or a lack of understanding, perhaps, of a, of a really new technology, the, the benefits that, that they could achieve. So I'm just wondering if you comment a little bit about that, that we know from other examples, there's a lot of resistance in the marketplace to radically new ideas. How is that related to your concepts around uh, uh, breaking the status quo bias? Yeah, I mean, I think there's this clearly, a, it's a perennial theme, right? Innovation is a perennial theme. And what are, um, and resistance, but I think there's, there's, to my mind, um, not necessarily always a lot of structure of trying to understand the underlying factors to this resistance. Yes, we know that it's resisted, but what are the underlying factors? And then once you understand those factors, can you develop uh, structures and uh, interventions and understand mechanisms specifically to uh, understand those, those, those particular uh, pitfalls that can befall an organization? So, I mean, I'm happy to speak about some specific stuff, but, um, yeah, in general, there's a, there's a lot of stuff on innovation, but I think not so much attention has been given to what, to the underlying causes of why the status quo is so persistent, just again, across a tremendous amount of industry. And I'm, and I'm not just, of course, technology is a common theme of, of uh, an impetus to change, but it's not just about technology. There's all sorts of, um, all sorts of strategic reasons for change that don't necessarily involve technological changes. There's other changes in customer preferences in the market and so on that are not just technology driven. Right, well, related to that thought, Paul had a question about uh, your, your example of competing ideas. Uh, are there particular approaches to marketing analytics or intelligence insight that might do a better job of generating those competing ideas or, or getting them to be accepted as alternatives? So your thoughts about the kind of the role, I suspect a lot of the folks in the audience are from the insights function in their companies. And so what would your advice be about the type of research or insights that could help generate those competing ideas and, and get them uh, considered by management? Um, well, I mean, I think, so about the types, I'm not so sure, but I think if you have a, an important insight there, it's not enough just to deliver that insight, I think is the lesson here, right? So there's a lot of times I, I've worked with some companies and the insights team is generating insights, but do those insights get used? I think that's oftentimes, sometimes they do, so oftentimes they don't. And so I think there needs to be a degree of advocacy. If there's a very important insight that's critical and fundamental, then uh, advocacy within the organization, for example, um, pitching it to people throughout the organization, just like, you know, one of the things William Sims did, for instance, that actually got him an initial test done by the Bureau of Ordnance, but they uh, didn't test it properly, but he, that initial test was he basically sent his letters, he sent his reports just to the Bureau of Ordnance. What he ended up doing was sending it to all the officers throughout the fleet. And then these officers raised the issue with Washington and said, hey, what's going on? Why are we, is, this, is there something to what Sims is saying? And so I think disseminating and broadcasting ideas is very important and also uh, doing it in a sustained fashion. It's not enough just to put them out there once. Like Billy Mitchell did, like Sims did, you have to oftentimes, if it's something that's very fundamental and change is not gonna occur right away and people's beliefs are not gonna change right away, then it has to be done in a, in a much more sustained fashion and has to be broadcast widely and done in a way to position it and think really about how you you sell the insight and not just deliver the insight and think that that's the end of the job. Yeah, that, that's a, a great point, actually, because uh, I think it goes back to your example of uh, Percy Scott and working with the Admiralty. You made the point that they needed to feel like uh, they, they needed to get credit. That was their job to come up with these threat analyses and come up with solutions and their attempt to sort of own or get credit for that either delayed or in some cases maybe even block the improvement. I, I think a lot of times uh, 
there are people that are sort of information gatekeepers in an organization. You really need to understand their motivations, their identity that's involved in this whole process, and then maybe work or around them in the case of Sims, it sounds like. Um, I wonder, uh, comment too, uh, as you were talking about this, it reminded me there's some really interesting work. Uh, a guy named Tom Standage has written a book called The Victorian Internet, which was the telegraph uh, and radically uh, changed the nature of communications. But uh, companies and countries were slow to adopt it if they had a good enough solution. Famously, the French had a semaphore relay system. They didn't need the telegraph, and they were also slow to adopt the Internet 100 years later uh, because they had Minitel as a good enough solution. So I wonder if you could comment on that notion. It, it, I think it relates to your point about complacency. If there is a need that people have developed a kind of a workaround, an ad hoc solution, you know, that may be the classic case where if you've got a good cat, you don't need the better mousetrap. So what are your thoughts about that sense of kind of a good enough solution supplanting or preventing the better one? Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, I think there's a lot of uh, reasons for complacency. Certainly um, what you just suggested, having a, you know, sufficiently, sufficiently good solution perceived to be a sufficiently good solution to get the job done is probably one of, I will comment just as an aside on, the telegraph, that that was actually critical for Sims in his, in his endeavors, because he was able to, in the past, he wouldn't have been able to disseminate his ideas all the way from China to Washington and all the around the fleet all around the world. And he was able to use the telegraph to do that. But yeah, I mean, to your point, there's a lot of reasons for complacency. And certainly, I think um, having a solution that's good enough. And I think with the French, um, there's also the issue of identity, right? They wanted to have their own French designed solution. And so as opposed to um, relying on maybe an, what was an American developed solution. No, I'm sure that as a part of it. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, have seriously uh, have you come back and talk a little bit about the uh, your own challenge to loss aversion. I wonder if in some sense that wasn't an example of loss aversion itself when people who were vested in that theory reject your suggestions that it may not always apply or that maybe it was being overinterpreted. So I know that that's a topic that comes up a lot in our discussions uh, with members around behavioral economics, behavioral uh, decision theory. So maybe just a couple of comments from your own experience promoting your research on loss aversion and the reception that you got. Yeah, sure. And so um, we actually titled our one big conceptual overview paper, The Loss of Loss Aversion, Will It Loom Larger Than Its Gain? Basically saying, hey, is losing loss aversion yeah. like, going to loom larger than its gain? Because the idea of loss aversion is that losses loom larger than gains to an irrational degree. Right? In some cases, it's perfectly rational that a loss would be more impactful than a gain. Like for me, losing $10,000 might mean I can't pay my rent, whereas gaining $10,000 means I can maybe go on another vacation. So it's perfectly rational in that case. But there are cases that the, the loss aversion idea is that even when it's perfectly irrational for losses to be more uh, impactful than gains, people still overweight the losses. And that's where we, myself and Derek Rucker, my co-author, uh, dispute that. And so when I first wrote my initial paper on loss version, as I mentioned, as a graduate student, I thought, again, just by putting the idea out there, that it would get a, gain a lot of attention. Even the editor of the journal where I published it was a prominent psychologist. And he was like, oh, I'm, I'm excited to see what reaction it's going to get. Well, the reaction it got was exactly nothing. It was pretty much ignored. And I thought, well, my advisor was right. I'm going to stop working on this until after I get tenure. And that's what I did. And then I came back a decade later, and it was still very tough. Like, people treated loss version like gravity. And part of that, it was identity. I mean, there's a lot of people who had their reputation tied to it, but there's also reverence. It's kind of a romantic attachment to Kahneman and Tversky, who founded the fields of behavioral decision-making, behavioral economics, and to their ideas. And, and there was just this, this social proof. Everyone believed in it. Everyone was writing about it. Everyone was, even one-on-one, -on -one, I could convince people that loss version didn't necessarily make sense. But once they, the same people I convinced went back to writing papers, they would continue to cite it because that was just the agreed-upon social uh, reality. And so um, I actually challenged it. I actually was inspired in many ways by Billy Mitchell, by William Sims to basically broadcast my ideas more. And so we wrote this really uh, significant paper conceptual overview, challenging loss aversion, and got it to be accepted as a discussion article um, through this external force, this editor at a well-known journal. And she got several top uh, researchers to comment on it, which got it a lot of attention. And then that wasn't enough. I ended up writing op-eds in Scientific American and New York Times to basically try to disseminate these ideas and make 
and break kind of the social reality that was leading to belief in Las Vegas. Yeah, I think that uh, relates to something else you uh, emphasized at several points, and that, uh, again, the identification that people have with the theory or with what they perceive to be their job, their role. And maybe if you comment a little bit more about um, appealing to people, I mean, instead of saying the identity is going to be a point of resistance and prevent them from assimilating new ideas or, or challenging conventional wisdom, is there a way to appeal to their sense of identity and kind of get them over that hump? I'm, I'm thinking specifically of your point about the sailors I, and your interesting observation. We still call them sailors long after the age of sail, but there was clearly something involved there about their sense of who they were, what their motivations were, their identity. Um, just your thoughts about working within organizations to really try to appeal to your fellow employees to get around some of those challenges. Yeah. I mean, that's a, uh... That's a really good question. I, I think changing people's, trying to maybe make the change to fit in line with people's identity, I think it's a worthwhile thing to do. It's not always possible, right? So I, I give the, another example you can think about when, um, it used to be in the, early, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, when firing accurately from a ship wasn't very possible, the person who was in charge of firing guns from the ship, maybe we can think of that person as analogous to the person responsible for digital analytics in the past in a marketing organization, that person wasn't of high social status and that person wasn't high on the promotion list. And suddenly that person, when the gunnery revolution transpired, suddenly the gunnery officer was a very important person in the company of the ship and was high on the promotion list. And so the identity of the people that were not gunnery officers was threatened by that. And is there a way to change their identity in a way? To some degree, maybe there was a way to try to, try to make them perceive the change as consistent with their identity. Um, but I think it's very, very challenging. Just like with now someone who doesn't have any insight into digital or knowledge about digital analytics is maybe going to feel that they are not as likely to maybe have the status within an organization as they did in the past when that wasn't as important. That's a good point, actually. Uh, and I, I want to have one last question that comes from Warren, I think relates to this point as well. Um, and he says that in work he's done inside large organizations, uh, you see that there, uh, in response to external changes, there are a variety of perceptions about what is happening. There is, there's no coherent, uh, you know, overview of how to respond to that change. And so maybe what you get is kind of a, you know, paralysis uh, from a lack of uh, a vision of how to change. Just your comments about that, a bit, again, about sort of aligning around, I'm, I'm sort of reading between the lines here, but aligning around a more coherent understanding of how the environment's changed and what kind of uh, change is needed. Yeah, right. So I think it, it requires an intersection of these competing ideas. There have to be ideas. An idea does not have to be just, you know, in words. It can be a prototype or it could be whatever, that I, whatever form the idea takes. But then it really ultimately requires this external force. There has to be someone who's above the level and again, not, I don't want to say always, but generally what you see is there's someone above the level of where the change needs to happen, who needs to make a bold, decisive action and point to a particular di direction, ideally the necessary di direction in which the company needs to go in. Um, you see that, for example, in um, Steve Ballmer when Microsoft was developing the Courier tablet. And they had invested a lot of resources in it and it was getting close. They had moved through all the major gates of the stage gate process. And it was getting actually pre pre rave previews in the tech press. People were excited about it. It was supposed to launch shortly after, um, or not that long after Apple's iPad launch. And there was a lot of pressure to launch it to show that Microsoft was still you know, a player in the game. But there was resistance within the organization also because it wasn't dependent on the Microsoft operating system. And so the Windows operating system. And so there was a lot of conflict within the organization. And ultimately, Bomber made the decision to kill the courier project. And it took another two years until they launched the surface, <clears throat> so, which was compatible with Windows because they believed, he believed that that was important to the French. So there was all the momentum was going towards launching that courier tablet. And yet he, he was someone who was above the level where the change needed to be made. He had the grand objective of the organization in mind, as opposed to maybe the individuals in the courier group who really wanted it to happen, the people within the Windows group who really didn't want it to happen, as someone who was somewhat external to the particular uh, interests of those particular divisions, he was able to make that change, but it, of course it required a bold call on his part.
Yeah, that, that's a great uh, closing example then where it really does take that sort of visionary executive to reconcile those tensions within the organization. That's always going to be the case and, and that sense of direction and mandate from the top often you know proves to be the difference yeah. uh, again i want to thank david for a really, really interesting presentation and discussion and thank the audience for joining us we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar soon and if you have additional questions about the presentation you can follow up with david at dgaluic at gmail.com dgaluic at gmail.com and I want to remind the audience that since 1961, Nonprofit MSI has brought together the best minds in marketing from major corporations and top business schools around the world to improve business practice by applying science to marketing's biggest challenges. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Lunch uh, and Learn webinar. Thank you very much.